Okay, great, we'll, we'll start. So um, thanks everyone for coming in person and online. And um, I'm just briefly going to introduce the three speakers today. Um, in my capacity as someone who is um, associated with Lee's Andrews and Marcia's project in a, an administrative way. So um, they're reporting in on an ACR project, a sort of scoping project that they've been working on. And um, our in-person speaker today is Lee Vile, who is a um, rice farmer, a former um, employee of IRI, the International Rice Research Institute in both Laos and um, the Philippines and also was with ACR as a program manager for a short time. Uh, also online, we have Andrew McWilliam, who is um, a, a long-term researcher in the islands to our north and speaker of Indonesian, speaker of Tetun and um, author of many papers, um, which if you want to orient to uh, Indonesia, Eastern Indonesia and um, uh, Timor-Leste, uh, please seek out Andrew's paper, including a paper entitled How Many Not Many, which is a um, linguistic pun about the uh, title in the title, which is about Sandalwood Estate and management and degradation in Timor Island. Um, the third speaker is Marcia, um, sorry, Marcia's surname. Marcia Exposto El Silva. Ex Exposto del Yes, Silva. Silva. It is Esposto de Silva. Um, sorry, Marcia, I should have got your uh, surname in, in my head before I launched in. Um, Marcia is a um, in-country member of the research team. And um, according to Lee, is a fantastic researcher and asset to the project. So um, Lee's explained they're very lucky to have someone with Marcia's skills um, on the team. So I'll hand over to Lee now. <laughs> and Lee, please feel free to introduce um, the rest of the team. Before you launch, I just want to mention we've got some uh, uh, Northern Australian elders in the room. <laughs> um, we've got Graham Hockey, who's formerly of the Lands Department, and we also have Rob Wesley Smith. Um, Rob's an activist in Timor Leste for many decades, including prior to independence. And um, uh, both, you know, both, oh, he is a well known person in Darwin for that. And Graham was just explaining that he's working on some water projects in the mountains of Timor Leste. So, um, not lovely to have uh, them on campus today. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jenny. And firstly, so I'm a little bit nervous to be speaking in front of some, some elders and um, people who, whose experience in Timor Leste is vastly greater than mine. So, I hope I don't make too many blunders. I think Penny's summed up our team quite well. I'm very privileged to be working with Andrew McWilliam, who has, as you say, vast experience in the region. And I'm um, very pleased to be working with Marcia, who um, is undertaking quite a, a substantial task there in Dili to help um, bed in this initial SRA and what we hope will be a larger project thereafter. So they will... Um, speak in due course, but let me set the scene and, and off we go. So in 2019, I think, pre-COVID, ACR came to both Andrew and myself, um, requesting us to scope out a piece of agricultural R and R&D work um, to ex help expand its agricultural R&D program in Timor-Leste. It's looking to take a greater a greater a presence in the country and in the region and um, put that task in front of us. Needless to say, COVID intervened fairly shortly thereafter. So we've, we're a few years hence now. Um, ACR projects have three parts to what they try to achieve. The first one is scientific progress. The second one is impacts for beneficiaries. And the third one is capacity building for agricultural R&D in country. Now, notwithstanding those three parts to an ACR project, we've been given an, an, a general theme of um, wanting to improve uh, rural livelihoods in Timor-Leste. ACR, ACR gave us quite a blank slate and said, you, you take a fresh look, go to where you think you should go, and research what you think you should research. So here we are faced with the question of what research questions do we ask? Mm. 
Oh, maybe down. The little the mouse crawling. Right. It's a great picture, isn't it? But we'd better have something else. It's on, but not. It's Nope. Oh. Right. Now, again, notwithstanding, there's some greater minds than I here on, on Timor Leste, but let me at least briefly sum up. Timor Leste is a developing, developing nation, but compared to the rest, of the rest of the region, it's at quite an early stage of development. And without slavishly going through economic development um, parameters, a good indicator is the still widespread presence of malnutrition and stunting amongst the population, which you look elsewhere in the region is not that common. Its agriculture is still quite underdeveloped. It's generally low productivity. If, if you look at it compared to, the re, compared to the region, yields of rice, yields of maize, yields of other staple crops are, are remarkably low. And from what we can perceive, still generally declining. Methods are still generally quite manual and little use has been made so far of even basic agricultural technologies, um, mechanisation, fertiliser. Herbicides are making an appearance now in some places. There's still a long way to go. And in an agricultural sense, Timor has not very many of what we might call comparative advantages. The soils due to its, um, the whole island's sedimentary and geomorphic origin, the soils are generally low in fertility. The climate is quite variable and vulnerable to, particularly to Pacific Ocean dynamics. Logistics are not easy. It's a mountainous country. And although they're improving, roads are still something of a limitation. Um, so, so for a conventional agricultural value chain of getting products to farm and away from farm, that's not necessarily as easy as it sounds. And of course, the whole country still operates on the US dollar, which, um, which, which means that it doesn't have the ability to depreciate currency to, to build um, competitiveness in agriculture or in other, activity, in other uh, economic activities. So it's into this relatively challenging context that we've come. And we certainly realised that we had to choose our research questions with great care. This is not a place for pursuing uh, specialties, not a place for pursuing pet research questions. We had to take great care to, to ascertain what would be the most constructive research questions to ask to fulfil what ACR wanted of us. So what we underdid, un, undertook was a small uh, specific research activity, SRA, which, which ACR allows you to commission, whose entire intent was to devise the research question. So we, we chose a cross section of important farming systems and locations, three livelihood zones and uh, two locations within each livelihood zone. And then we put the social science process first I've been involved in a number of agricultural projects over the years, and often the social science process either begins midway through the project or often involved at the end in some sort of ex post analysis. But we've put the social science process first uh, to understand issues and current trajectories of livelihoods, to characterise the locations. And then we're going to go through a process of participatory research question selection. And we're, we're at that point right now. So Marcia and I are armed with a relatively long list of research questions we've gleaned from what we've done so far. And Marcia and I will be taking those back to the communities next week. So in that sense, Andrew um, in a moment will present 
uh, the stages of progress methodology that he's brought to this project to understand the trajectory of livelihoods from a, from a fixed point in time before, beforehand, to give an understanding of, in a, in a livelihood sense, what works and what doesn't work. Marcia will report on what we've learned about the study locations themselves. We've managed to happen upon a reasonably diverse set of study locations um, and, and to some diverse uh, set of cultural contexts as well. And then I will report on the long list of research questions that we've, we've ascertained um, from there and, and that long list that Marcia and I will be taking to the communities next week and then hopefully there's time for some questions. So Andrew, I'd like to invite you to, uh, to speak and please command me to change the uh, slides when you wish. Uh, <clears throat> thanks Lee, um, I'll, I'll do that. Good afternoon everybody, um, thank you for coming. Uh, let me just go straight into it then. Uh, Lee mentioned that um, we are looking at different livelihood zones, which have been mapped onto the country of uh, Timor-Leste. And I'm just pointing out here where we've chosen to look at these different areas. We, we kind of um, emphasize the Western uh, part of Timor-Leste because that's where the population is. Uh, but we also felt we needed to have a, uh, a representation from the Eastern part. And now, so, our objective, as Lee has explained, is to try and get a better understanding of the opportunities and constraints in these zones, the kind of constraints that these zones um, show, show up for people there. And zones that influence rural livelihoods and the economic well-being of the households there. So we, through these different forms of assessment, we, we're trying to develop a range of indicators that can inform the design, uh, development and implementation of the next project phase, as uh, Lee also mentioned. And our aim is really to facilitate a rise in rural productivity and resilience, uh, significant rise, so up to 30%. We think that's the kind of uh, target we should go for to make this uh, a kind of realistically interesting uh, exercise for uh, rural, uh, livelihood, uh, rural households to uh, participate in. And we want to do that by aligning ourselves with the community interests and express economic uh, aspirations that they have. So um, these three areas are uh, just briefly are Batano on the south coast there uh, in Manafai, Ainaro up in the mountains and Balkao uh, out in the east. We will switch now, uh, Lee. Let me say something about the stages of progress def uh, methodology. This is a, a methodology I implemented with others in Indonesia a few years back and found it particularly uh, useful uh, for understanding local definitions of poverty and exploring questions with communities about things like how do the poor understand poverty and what enables some households to escape poverty over time while their neighbours do not. So there's a process you go through to generate these local definitions. Um, and I've got a list of things which uh, the, tech, the methodology seeks to, seeks to develop over time. So it's a focus on local factors that influence and shape poverty from people's own perspective. And it guides community empowerment and an understanding of the diverse cons constraints and opportunities that they face in their own particular context. And it also provides a means to, uh, to link micro and macro poverty alleviation strategies. I think that's particularly valuable. And in this very short talk, I want to kind of illustrate the sorts of, at least in our case, preliminary results that we've uh, gained from undertaking this process. Um, I want to mention here that... Uh, as part of our project team, we've uh, secured the services of a group of researchers from the National University, UNTIL, uh, led by Dr. Matias Tavares, um, who's uh, implementing this methodology in six case study communities. Uh, and we've got to the point now where we've finished uh, the first kind of exercise of completing the surveys. Um, things have been disrupted for various reasons, the wet season and the recent uh, national elections. But we're at a point now where, where we can analyze a lot of the data that we're generating. So at this point, I, I can only give you some preliminary perspectives. Uh, and uh, let's change over then, Lee. So I want to talk a little bit about how we go through this process. The first step is, I mean, you have to negotiate your access to the community uh, within a village. Uh, 
in this in this particular area. And having then what we do is is uh, get together a representative group of village people to work out together through a process of uh, discussion. Uh, you could call it focus group discussion to define the local level of poverty, and particularly to try and define the poverty line for the community there. What does it look like? What does it mean for people to be really poor in this community? What are some, what are some of the kind of um, uh, phrases that people use to describe that? And what happens if they get a little bit money, a bit more money? Typically, what do people do if they get some more money? You know, the next step in their stage uh, of rising up out of poverty. So this um, little table I'm showing you here comes from one of the villages, one of the communities we looked at, in uh, Ainaro, in the mountains, uh, and you can see here, these are these are the kind of stages that people decided collectively that this is what it might look like in this area, and they've they've described this uh, cut off line, this Kibit Lake, is uh, it comes from actually a, um, a government term, familiar Kibit Lake, which kind of loosely translates as vulnerable families, but in in their terms refers, I think, more generally, according to Mateus at least. Uh, when, when families can't um, send their kids to school, when they can't uh, fix their house or they build a very simple house out of bamboo, when they have trouble participating in the ritual exchanges and ceremonies of the local community, uh, they're unable to provide an animal, for example, to a feast or whatever. So really a, at a very low level uh, income. And as you rise up, uh, you're able to secure more, uh, more economic assets. And that's what you see as you go through this list, that gradually you rise up to a something we, they might call a prosperity line and not poor at all line um, and so on. So each of these communities has a kind of, uh, has developed a, a framework like this, uh, which gives you a sense of um, the economic perspectives and this definition of poverty that the community has. Okay, next one. The second step we do is um, having generated this list, we then ask, the community to think about a time perspective it can be 10 years, 20 years, something that everyone remembers and to try and compare the status of uh, households in that community then with now. And so we also use our representative group. So there have to be people with a, a history of living in the village and have an understanding of how things have, have gone. And the ex we do an exercise then to list all the households in the hamlet this case, maybe 100, 120 households, and categorize them into these four categories you see here. A is, were they poor back then, let's say 10 years ago, and are they still poor? Or B, were they poor back then and now they're not poor? They've risen over that line. Uh, were they C, were they not poor back then, but now they're poor, they've fallen into poverty for some reason. And D, they weren't poor before and they're still not poor. So, it, so there's a process where you go through the list of uh, households and you you mark them with one of these uh, letters. Um, and I must say in my experience and also the team's experience, it's, it's quite a straightforward activity. It might seem intrusive to some, but the fact is that these people know each other's economic circumstances intimately, usually. Uh, very, they know them very well. So it's quite straightforward for them to categorize. And then once we have these categories of all the households, we pick a sample of 40, 40 households based on the relative proportion of A, B, C, and D. That sounds a bit complicated, but um, I'll hit, hit, the, um, hit the button again. Don't lose the screen. Yeah. So here's an example from one, one of our communities. Once we went through that process and we then made our proportional sampling, we ended up with, um, that doesn't add up at all. Um, I think it's meant to be 20. I'm not sure how that works out. Anyway. I think um, it's notwithstanding. It should be 22, I think, and it's uh, 18 uh, and one. I don't know how I fixed that. Anyway, the point is that you come up with this categorization of households in the community, where in this case, you had quite a large number of A's who are poor and have been poor for a long time. You also have a pretty large number of B's, almost the same uh, number. So they've been able to rise out of poverty by some means. Uh, and you have one, one D, one, one family who's quite well off, who's prosperous. Um, so there's an example here. It should be 83, that's right. Total of 83. So this is the sample of all the households in this hamlet. Uh, and it's just mix that up. Anyway, so this is, so once we get this mix here, we then undertake a household survey of 
these people who are categorized each in each of these categories, we then go through the hamlet and make a serve household survey with the uh, head of household or a member of that household. And we can move on to the next one. Right. And so once, yeah, once they're identified and they agree to participate, this household survey is undertaken. And within that survey, there are 35 questions designed to analyze the domestic economy of the households and a whole range of questions which point to the sort of economic standing, the economic activity they do, uh, and the challenges they face. In addition to that household survey, there are two other surveys which we're following up with. One is a food security survey, um, which ideally is undertaken before the harvest, the main harvest, because that's the time when people usually uh, experience stress uh, in terms of food supplies. And if you do it at that time, it's the best time to do it because people have a much greater awareness of the limitations of their food supply. Uh, that's one aspect. And the second one is a dry season income survey because all across Timor, um, people always engage once they, 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 the, uh, the crops have been harvested, there's a sort of fallow period uh, when people embark on different kinds of in supplementary income activity. And all across the country, you find that happening. There's a whole range of uh, choices people can make, make in terms of how they generate income. Uh, but this is a useful survey to find out what sorts of choices they make in these particular areas, because, because that gives you an insight into the kind of opportunities and resources that are available for these people uh, to access to generate the supplementary income. So that's something that ideally you do as it, as it suggests, in the dry season, it's been complicated in East Timor because of the timing. Some in the south coast, of course, there's a much longer wet season or a double wet season. So it's tricky to find those windows. Um, but anyway, that's what the idea of the surveys is, is to get this data together. Uh, and then once we've done all that, we then analyze uh, the, each of the households within each of the settlements. So you then get up and what's happening now is the team is generating a large amount of uh, data coming out of the household surveys, putting it through a statistical package, and we're going to get a lot of information. And I'm just going to show you a few things that I've, they've sent me recently, just to give you a sense of the kind of information. So it's the next slide. Oh, that's not the slide I want. That one. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so... The main household incomes is an interesting one. So 87.4% of A's were farmers. So the poor people were all farmers, mostly. But only 62% of the B's, the people who weren't poor, uh, were farmers. And interestingly, 10.6% of the B's, this is across uh, all six of the Hamlet, 10% of them worked as government staff, the uh, Funcionario Publico, uh, and 10% were drivers and contractors. So they were pursuing kind of... Uh, non-farm, I would call it, off-farm activities to generate significant portions of their income. The second point was that non-poor families, sorry, uh, bees, <clears throat> make more money from the sale of cultivated vegetables than poor families, which is maybe counterintuitive, I don't know. But what, what we see from the data then is that 7.6% of A households earn between $300 and $500 from vegetables. So a relatively small percentage. Whereas 25% of the category Bs, the people who weren't poor or were on the margins, earned that kind of money. So there's a significant difference there in terms of uh, the, the income they can generate from this particular activity. And next, hit the next one, Lee. But then finally, um, just we asked the question about what were the key problems that people faced when they're cultivating their crops. And here are, here are four of the main ones which I think are classic across Timor-Leste too, for anyone who knows how things work there. Uh, strong winds. <coughs> winds at the point of before harvesting, because they a lot of the maize they grow is incredibly tall, it gets uh, wiped out through strong winds by being blown over. There was excess, either excessive rain or excessive uh, drought, which caused 20% uh, damage to the crops that people grew. And there was a range there between 5 and 32%. Uh, another one was pests and weeds. Uh, weeding is a classic uh, problem for Timorese farmers because it's a big, uh, it requires a lot of labour input to manually weed the crops. And if you don't weed or you delay weeding, it, it reduces the yields you get from your um, rain-fed agriculture. And the last one was the lack of tractors and high rents. Um, 
<laughs> like um, chair cropping, uh, excuse me, uh, which is another factor. It was a lesser factor, but it's one that people, it was a significant one that came out of the inform, uh, information. So they're the points I make. We hope to get a lot more information out of that. And I just, I just finished by saying that one of the other advantages of uh, using the stages of pro uh, progress methodology is that two things. You get very familiar with the community very quickly because of this process, I find. And one of the advantages of maintaining your connection with them, and I hope we do this in the future project, is that you can follow their progress, as it were, follow their experiences as we move into the next phase of the project. So they can stand as a kind of um, yardstick or a signpost for the project because we know them as it were we can see how well or, or not that the project is achieving its outcomes and that's that's where I see another sort of significant benefit of it okay that's it that's for me thank you Andrew that was a very thorough summary of uh, the, the process and those those initial results Right, now I'd like to introduce Marcia S. Marcia S. Silva. Uh, so we, we undertook the stages of progress methodology and then Marcia's done a power of work that, and with the assistance of two, in particular, two UNTL students, Jamie and Ellie, in following a, an altered rapid rural appraisal process to understand a little bit more about these study locations um, given we've done the, the stages of progress with them. So I'd like Marcia to present on what she's found from that process. Marcia, how's the connectivity? Yep, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Once again, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes. yes. Very clearly. Okay, perfect. So this is Marcia joining in from Dili. Um, I hope I will have a good internet connectivity for the next 10 minutes or so to deliver my presentation. So I'm going to talk about what we learn about the chosen communities. Um, next slide, please, Dr. Lee. <coughs> Thank you. So yes, in this image, as you may have known that Timor-Leste has 14 municipalities and we were to choose out of these three livelihood zones to focus on. So Therefore, to guide us, we develop a list of selection criteria and apply that to the study done by Rob Williams and friends on the approach to characterize agriculture livelihoods and livelihood zones using the national census data in Timor-Leste. So from that process, we have our selected municipalities. As you may see on the southern part, so we have Manufahi as the southern rain fed, and then we have Ainaru for the upland altitude area, and then we go to the Northeast of the country, we have Baukau for the Northern Inland Irrigable Area. Next slide, please, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Yep. So after the stages of progress process as presented by Dr. Andrew while ago, we use another instrument, as Dr. Lee mentioned, rural, rapid rural appraisal. So this is to guide our discussion with community in each location. And from that, we were able to put some information together. So. Here in Manufahi municipality, we selected two hamlets from, from Betanu village, that is Loro and Bemetang. So in Betanu, where Loro and Bemetang is located at, this is a flat and large area for farming. So especially at Loro hamlet. So Loro is the area designated for, for farming and farmers from other hamlet could own a piece of land in Loro and do, do their farming activities there. So since Loro is located in the southern rainfed area, it is it has a high rainfall. In fact, farmers in Betanu enjoy the opportunity of growing their crops all year round. So they can grow maize two or even up to three times a year. So when you drive around the Loro, you could see square divisions of hectares of land with variety of crops being grown like maize, banana, vegetables, root crops, fruits, and many others. But still maize is being the main crop. So in fact, Betano is known for its largest maize production area. And there are few hectares of rice field, but it is turning into maize field now as the irrigation system had been damaged for about four years, I think. So yeah, and they also raise animals like cattle, pigs, goat, and chicken. And being in the coastal area, this community also do fishing. So as one of the iconic area uh, point also, Betanu is, a, is the area where 
you can find the biggest electricity power station of the country. It's located there. And future plan is that to, to open a highway from Suai running through Betanu. So that will connect Betanu to Natarpora and Vikeke. What does it mean? It simply means that this will give opportunity for farmers in Betanu to connect to neighboring municipalities that will give a promising market link to Betanu farmers. So with this opportunity, uh, we will still see that the agriculture system, as Dr. Lee mentioned in his introduction, it's still somehow limited. Although I, I put here it's semi-modern agriculture, but compared to other uh, developing nations, it's, it's still limited. Farmers do using tractors to open their land. Some are adopting technology introduced by other development partners like FAO. So they use velvet bean as cover crops and then no burning, no tilling, just using hand tractor for land preparation. So that compared to other municipalities, we can see they are a little bit uh, going forward or modern. So because of these exposures, most farmers are familiar with the use of Roundup and other types of herbicides. But funny enough, they are reluctant to use to the use of fertilizers. So when we do our discussion, some farmers even comment that using fertilizer, or sometimes they refer to as medicine, they said will change the taste of the crops or maize. So yeah, but but the Tano community has a strong farmers group. These are being formed through projects. Some are from during Indonesian time, and some even have their own initiative to form their farmers group. So this group is basically to come working together rotationally, help each other in their farms, because labor is really intensive when you do farmer, farming in Timor-Leste, so they need to form group and help each other. So just want to show you a picture on the other side. That's a typical day in Betano during planting season. Women will come gather together. They bring food, bring water for their meals of the day and then for them to do their farming. So in this case, they, they are going to plant maize. Next slide, please, Dr. Lee. So as we move further to another municipality, we go to Ainaro municipality. This is the upland area. So in this municipality, we focus on two hamlets, that's Raibutiudu and Gorema. So these two communities, they are in upland area. It's slopey areas with wet, windy, and cold climate. So it's totally different from Betano. Community in Raibutiudu, they grow different varieties of crops. So they do have rice, it's about 50 hectares there. They also have vegetables, few maize area, aquaculture. They, they do raise cattle and buffalo, buffalo especially to help them in rice farming because they cannot use tractor with the uh, landscape that they have. And they also raise some chicken. Um, they also have some high value crops such as coffee integrated with vanilla. Uh, in contrast to Raibutiudu, Gorema. Gorema is about one and a half hour drive away from Raibutiudu. They are more on horticulture crops. So they have vegetables, potatoes, carrots, some stone fruits, few areas of maize as well. So the farming system in these two areas is rather conventional compared to the tunnels. They are, they are very traditional. So they prepare their land manually. They, they plant mostly by broadcasting. And that's actually make it difficult for them to control or manage the, the weed. So during our discussion, some farmers said, oh, they have, they, they have a very good income from carrots. So they bought carrot seed and they broadcasted it. But then now they have to take care of it. So it's very difficult for them to manage the weed. So someone has to sit the whole day and try to pull out the smallest weed found within the Carrot, carrot plants, and they have to do it very carefully. And normally this job is done by women. So, but compared to about Betano community in Ainaro, especially, they have a very strong social system. So they value their Tarabandu greatly. Uh, Tarabandu is a, is a local term. So it's a Tetum word. It refers to the local rules and regulations that local community establish to manage or to, to manage the relationship that they have with their natural resources. So it could be done on the use of water, forest fire, or, or how they take care of their animals. So in Ainaru, they, the community agree, they, they have their animals freely grazed, but when it is uh, cropping season, they have to cage their animal. And, and also in, in Gorema, Gorema have a very special uh, case of community group. 
So they have, it works as a cooperative group. It's not only about saving loan for money, but they, they, they come together to help, to help each members build, construct their house or send their children uh, for their education and also help a family when there is a family member passed away. So a uh, picture on the other side is just uh, an image showing a typical cropping season in Gureva. Next slide, please, Dr. Lee. And moving to the east-north, that's the part of uh, northern inland irrigable area, that's we choose Baukau. So in Baukau, we focus on two community groups. We have Kaihula and Saraida. So Baukau is also a sloppy area, but it's not too much, and they have a temperate climate. Uh, community in Kaigula and Saraida, they also grow all sorts of vegetables. They have fruit trees, root crops, but also they have a large area for rice farming. They raise the same animals, right? Like cattle, pigs, goat, and chicken. And yeah, this, the community have, their, their farming system is a bit semi-modern compared to Ainaro. So they, some of people are also using tractors for farming, but still in a very limited number. Some also are open to use of fertilizers, but they, they are not exposed yet to the use of herbicides. So that makes it very difficult for them to manage their weed. They have to done it manually. And still the same also, uh, like in Ainaro, community in Kaihula and Saraida also have a strong uh, social system in Tarabandu, and they have a very strong women group there. Uh, when we have a discussion, they said that the women there are very uh, serious with their work. So they, they do farming all day and during dry season when there is no water around to water their crops this uh, they would walk for a few kilometers to other neighboring hamlet to fetch water and come and water their crops so they're very determined in their work but um in this in this part of the timor leste the community have a quite different characteristics compared to betano and ainaro uh, Betano and Anaro in the western part. So community in Baukau, they use uh, local language we call Makasai, so we call them Makasai people. They have a very different characteristics. This, this community are very outspoken and straightforward. Okay, next slide, please, Dr. Lee. Thank you. So, so from this, uh, this information that put together, to sum it up, we think that there's a common theme that we have here in this six location. So number one, we think labor is an issue. So for a hectare of land, farmer would need at least 10 people to help them in land preparation, planting, weeding, and harvesting. Land preparation, weeding, and harvesting are particularly labor intensive as they would need more people for two to three days to do the work. And they have to pay the labor about $5 per day per person. And it's not only that, but they also have to pre prepare meals for the workers as well. And the second, with all the effort that they put, the yield return itself is not really encouraging. So in a hectare of land for rice production, for example, they would only have about one to one and a half ton per hectare. Maize production could go up to about four tons per hectare, but many times they don't weigh this. So they only compare it to how many sacks they could fit in uh, after a harvest in a one hectare of land. So this is the this is the things that we, we, we see, the trend, the common theme we have. Surprisingly, there is no market issue from this uh, not much market issue in these uh, locations. Farmers in these locations say that they do have people come in and buy their produce. So for example, in Betano, these past few few years during COVID, they they have they sell uh, they they sell their produce and there are actually people coming and buy. It's because of the government program we call Sesta Basica. So Sesta Basica is a government program for economic recovery during COVID-19. So a lot of people will come, company come and buy their produce and to be distributed to other citizens of involved in this program. Yep, I think uh, that's all from my part, Dr. Lee, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. As I said, Marcia and her two, uh, UN, the two UNTL colleagues have done a wonderful job giving some real colour to these six different locations to understand just what makes them tick. So now I'd like to present something of the long list of research questions that we've developed. It's 
the process is still ongoing and there may be other research questions appear from left field, but we now are at a stage we can start narrowing down a little. And I guess there's a there's a few comments I'd like to like to make. What I what I found was a we've got a, a really pleasing number of research questions. I I had a fear that we were going to have a bit of a Mother Hubbard's cupboard effect, and you know, we, real, would we have many meaningful research questions to present to these communities to pursue? That's certainly not the problem. If anything, we've got a few too many research questions, so that we'll have to we'll have to whittle away. I think there's a central theme of on-farm labour productivity, as Marcy has mentioned, in all six locations, there is this common theme of labour supply, even being able to afford hired labour as a, as a common limitation to getting things done. Either it, it means the amount that's planted is, is limited or the amount of management that it's applied, applied to their agricultural system isn't isn't as good as it could be in particular weeding um, so there's this this overarching issue of having enough labor particularly at peak times to um, achieve what they want to on farm um, and if you think about it conceptually improving labor productivity can be done by increasing yield on any given uh, area of land that takes the same labour to operate, or it could be using less labour to achieve the same yield on that uh, piece of land, or it could be both. So I, I suspect we're gonna have that as a, as a central theme to our research questions. So hence, and this has got something of a monitoring and evaluation um, tone to it, but in all the locations, I think we will start with the question of what is the current labour productivity of the farming system? and look to understand that as well as we can. We may differentiate by gender in that question. Marcia has already referred to uh, endless weeding efforts in Garema um, to try and secure even basic vegetable yields. But then at the other end of the project, when we've hopefully um, pursued the right research questions and um, refined and introduced some innovations uh, to make some improvements, what is the incremental labour productivity that we've, we've produced? It, it will end up being a measure that we will be accountable for. Secondly, there appears to be a common element in all six locations of crop nutrition. And Marcy has already made the point that um, there's some uh, reticence to use fertilisers and Nona Casio can probably speak to that much better than I could. Um, be that because of historical use of fertilisers, traditional beliefs, et cetera. So what we'd, we'd like to do is to get away from sort of fertilisers in general and start to broach the issue, the issue of what is the limiting nutrient? Um, so come at it from a sort of a Liebig's law of the minimum approach. Already we've discovered um, a response to sulphur in Botano that, that was surprised to everybody, not, not, not phosphorus, not potassium, but sulphur. Um, so um, a, a number of times in the discussions, farmers did volunteer that maybe there's some deficiency in the soil. They even, they even framed it conceptually as vitamins for the soil, which is actually quite close to the idea of limiting nutrients. And then we would ask, how does yield and quality respond to that, that limiting nutrient? Um, and in there, there may be a place for something called microdosing, which is applying very, very low rates of fertilizer, but getting very, very useful responses for it. So we will explore that, that principle at all six locations on different crops, of course, but the idea will be the same. And the third common uh, theme of research question is that of weed management. At all locations, there's a battle with weed management. Uh, consequences, as uh, Marcia said, uh, with, with weed management, it tends to consume a lot of time and it can result in, um, even when done successfully, but if it's at all unsuccessful, then it uh, results in very, very low yields. So what would be the best weed management options? They could be herbicide, they could be cultural, they could be other. And what, of effect, what is the effect of applying those weed management nutrients, particularly its interaction with applying them with a limited nutrient? Because it may be once we apply the limited nutrient, the crop is a lot more vigorous, a lot more competitive against weeds, and hence we have a very helpful 
synergy. To some of the more specific questions, there's certainly some useful mechanisation questions we think are there. Um, my first uh, discussion group in Loro in Batano, very quickly, we were challenged to, to bring equipment that can, can seed their maize. Um, so I, I think there's a case for taking those first steps with seeding equipment uh, in Batano, in Garema, in Rabuti Udo, and in other locations. Um, so we will, we will look, look to do that. There could be mechanisation options for weeding. We've already touched on weed, weeding as being a major labour productivity constraint. There may be a case for inter-row cultivation at Garema, for example, in their vegetable production. And finally, the big, big, um, a big um, mechanisation could well be harvesting. Even just simple um, tools and technologies to, um, to remove grains from cobs of, of maize, for example. So we'll ask that general question of what are the mechanisation um, uh, opportunities in land preparation and seeding, in weeding and in harvesting and see where that goes. In two of locations, we think we'll ask questions about off seed season vegetable production. The two upland locations in Ainaru using plastic tunnels for vegetable production, which is not new in itself, but also considering its interactions with applying the most limiting nutrients, because in the parts of the wet season, it's, it's too cold and too windy and apply, uh, growing vegetables in, in tunnels could well be a very um, worthwhile uh, question to ask. There's a supplementary weed question, and that's what's the effect of biological control on mist flower. So in the, those upland locations, there's a, uh, a very competitive weed which has um, decimated pasture production in those locations to date. But this year, bi biological control is being introduced. And one of our research questions could be to monitor the effect of that introduction of biological control on mist flower distribution. And the final list, um, in Kelakai, uh, in, in, in um, Balkal, uh, it looks like we may well be pursuing animal husbandry questions. I, I must admit, I haven't, we haven't uh, worked our way through those questions particularly well, but it'll, it'll touch on grazing systems, on animal management and perhaps just on types of fodder. A previous pro ACR project, Ready Komodi, um, noted that in those Eastern locations, the fodder species they introduced did not work at all well. So maybe we need to revisit that and consider alternative fodder species. Uh, we will probably have some rice productivity questions, which me with my rice, rice background is probably <laughs> pleasing to be able to, to tackle one or two. Can rice be direct seeded in Raibuti Udo? It is already direct seeded in, in both locations in Balkal, but could we direct seed um, rice varieties in Raibuti Udo? Secondly, how can rice weeds be managed, efficiently managed in both locations in Balkal, in Kelakai and in Venalale? Uh, rice weeds are a major reason for very, very low rice productivity. So can we take a fresh look at rice weed management? And finally, at the three locations where rice is prominent in Raibuti Udo, but also in Kelakai and Venalali, um, Marcy has always already described these locations as temperate. In, um, with, with more altitude, the conditions are cool. Is this a situation where an upland japonica variety could be a much better match for that rice growing environment? So perhaps we might revisit the choice of varieties in those locations. I'm not sure how we'd achieve that, but at least at least explore the question of whether that'd be worthwhile. And it might be very helpful for these higher altitude locations. And finally, as Marcy has suggested, uh, the, the legume velvet bean or lehe um, plays quite a prominent role in Batano for fixing nitrogen, smothering weeds and providing quite a good substrate in which to grow their maize and other crops. So we may well ask the question, how does that lehe system improve with adding that limited nutrient that we're looking, looking to identify? So in conclusion, 
as I said, we seem to have a good, a healthy number of research questions to choose from and quite a few common ones, which is a pleasant surprise. I think it'll give us good coherence in an upcoming project, but a healthy number of site specific ones as well to do justice to the efforts that we've made truly understanding these locations. Labour productivity looks like a useful common theme for, for, um, for research questions to revolve around and to conduct a, a, a bigger project on. And finally, I, I note both in my own uh, interactions and in the notes that, that Marcy has made that the community's really appreciated being asked um, what research questions would make the most sense to them. So thank you for your time and thank you both Andrew and Marcia for, for your parts of the presentation and I invite some questions. Thanks team. Any, any um, I might turn the lights on too. Just watch me. Which switch, switch. <laughs> Yes. There must be one that's a master Hello. controller. Yeah. Yeah. Any any uh, questions for Lee or or Mas Mana Marcia or Andrew? In the time the Indonesians, um, Indonesians destroyed most of the rice crops and, and so on. Um, and I was involved with collecting some rice from the far southeastern corner around Alien Batter and that sort of thing. It was IR8 variety, I think, and and um, that also had to go up to the mountains. and And I, and I had I did see some crops of rice look fantastic up in the mountains, but, um, but it realised that supplying this IR8 variety to all over Timor was not going to be the best um, solution. And I was just wondering whether, um, in fact, um, they have managed to get appropriate varieties for the different locations because I don't know that you know so they did bring in a, a quite a number of prospective rice varieties in the seeds of life project which started very very early this century with with yeah. please discuss yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, well please feel free to interject yes, after, um, after you go for it, um, yes. but we how many how many varieties were released? How many rice varieties were released, Manacasio, from the Seeds um, of Life project? There are three is most famous in Timor Leste. One is called Atanacoma, Membrano, and uh, Guam. So the three is important. It's very high yield production. You can see it by seed of right hand. So three varieties released. And they're all indica varieties, aren't they? Yeah, okay. Many of those really for the high for the mountains, or just for the lowlands. Uh, the same variety for both. Same variety, yeah. no. I suspect that I don't know. I might get a rude shock when we investigate further, but I suspect there is a case for a variety that is specifically more suited to the higher higher altitude locations. But we'll we'll see as we explore yeah. the issue. Um, as a specific, for example, in Rabuti Uda, there's no shortage of water. The, the, the terraced system has wonderful irrigation supply and hence they had a wonderful ability to put water on the terraces and achieve quite robust weed control. And with an upland japonica variety, they would have the opportunity to water seed, I think, into you know, relatively cooler water and hence have a relatively ro robust form of weed management in a direct seeded system, but you really need a jabonica variety to, to make that go. So watch this space and it'll be interesting to see what we learn. Yeah. Can I just add something? Yeah. Lee? Yes, of course. Uh, well, my understanding is from the Seeds of Life review that is it Nacroma, the, the main rice, was very, has had a big take up. It's been uh, very successfully adapted in many parts of Timor Leste and uh, does well. Uh, and also say that there's still quite a lot of local, uh, the variety of red and black varieties of rice that are cultivated, which attract a high premium, but they're, um, the, the volume's not very large. Thanks. 
So just also about the uh, machinery use over there, it looks all largely the farm work based on the uh, human labor. So do they use any animals or um, what's the main problem um, for machine, even the most basic or small machine that can be used over there? Is that just because they couldn't afford that? Or they are in lack of all kinds of mechanisms like the road or, mach or, or, or maintenance of these things? I, th I think you might have struck on a couple of issues there. I know historically there's been a government um, program of providing mechanisation services with large tractors where in, in some places where large tractors work. My understanding is that system's not working particularly well now. It's interesting to see as, as you look around, you can see small tractors being used in some locations. And it, it's not a great stretch to imagine that that's probably the how mechanisation will progress for the foreseeable future is greater ad adaption of, of such small tractors because you look elsewhere in the region and that's that's exactly what happened. Um, with it will become those service industries of being able to maintain, provide spare parts, uh, new machines, secondhand machines, etc. So I think it might just be a matter of a function of time. And I, Perhaps the moment's about now where we'll get the greater uptake of two-wheel tractors. There's an FAO program at the moment um, sponsoring provision of uh, two-wheel tractors in a range of locations. Um, hopefully we're at that moment of, of, of something of a transition now because I, I suspect two-wheel tractors are going to be the most appropriate um, mechanisation source in many locations. They're a lot cheaper, they're a lot simpler, a lot easier to move in small fields. Does that make some sense? Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, because in the, the, our question that I do, I recognize that follows too much uh, of the small tractors. Uh, because I imagine they are all small households, it's not just small machines, it makes more sense compared with the big machines that are in the I agree. Yes. Yes, my last comment that I'm Yes, if we back to Dr. Lee and uh, Dr. Andrew presentation and uh, Smirsha presentation about the uh, mechanization is, is big problem in East Timor. In my study, I found that uh, mechanization is, is a key because it's mostly in the Timor list is using manual labor. It's like that one is time consumption and something very hard for them to cultivate it. Rice is actually when we cultivate it, it's, it's automatically we have to cultivate it in one big area that one is like in the same time, in the same period, you have to cultivate it. But to do it to the lack of mechanization, some farmers is today's day planting, and then some of them is waiting for another week, two weeks coming and planting. That one's the big issues for the pest and disease. So once the deadline for the planting and the line in the harvesting and the tracing, that one is also big losses in the post harvest sector, particularly for the uh, quantitative and qualitative losses is very big. So yes, I agree with the Dr. Steven that the mechanization is important, but we have to, we have to be careful. So which kind of mechanization is appropriate for sloping area like in East Timor and in a small scale, uh, small hold of farmers as uh, steamer. So hand tractor is probably good. And then uh, probably in the future, so we have to invest more on the harvester and the treasure because harvester is, treasure is, is lacking of harvester and treasure and then the line in the harvesting. The line in the harvesting is cost the losses, big losses in post harvest sector. That one is around 30 to 40% of losses in, in post harvest sector. It's very big. So yes. So I think mechanization is very important. And then in Timor-Leste, we have several varieties of rice for nacroma, and then one we call that um, membrano. That one is for the lowland areas, while on upland areas used to is like in combination with the black rice and red rice. So but the red rice currently is cultivated in wet, in paddy field areas as well. Before it's for upland area, for dry land, but now it's 
more cultivated in wetland areas as well for flooding areas. Thank you, you Manakasia. And great minds think alike. Marcia insisted in our research questions when we considered mechanisation, the first question to ask is, so what would be the appropriate mechanisation for the particular task we're considering? So we'd, we'd take some care to think about what form of mechanisation would fit the best. Yes, for this, for this case, mechanisation, uh, the big mechanisation probably we consider in the future is like a weeder, weeder or we, something we call that a rotary weeder. But again, rotary weeder is just appropriate for flood condition. For the right condition, if we come up with something called a direct seed lens or broadcast system, that one is not appropriate. So I think in the future, your studies indicated that the weed is big problem. So I think in the future, it's best idea by using herbicide. And then one thing I was found out in my study, my PhD study in Maliana, by using herbicide DM6, that one's worked very well. So even just spend around $12 for one can of herbicide, it entirely kill all wheat, all wheat in within one hectare. And that one is, is very cheaper. If compared with the labor, manual labor, that one is cost around 300 American dollar for one hectare. So herbicide is very good, but again, so this one's new product, so we need to come up with the, a thorough investigation in the future. Thank you, Malakashio. Um, just for the benefit of Lee, um, Andrew and Mana, Monica, um, I just wanted to introduce the speakers who I forgot to ask people to introduce themselves. Rob Wesley Smith is an agricultural scientist and long-term Timor Leste um, supporter. Professor Stephen Zhu has just arrived as a cropping and, and um, uh, horticulture professor in the new Research Institute for Northern Agriculture. And the last speaker was um, Monacasio de Costa Gutierrez, who's a um, staff member at UNTL and currently doing his PhD with us. Thanks. And now the next speaker is Ronju Ahmed, who's a postdoctoral research fellow at uh, Real. Thanks, Penny. Um, I would like to thank um, uh, Professor Ronju, and Dr. Lee, and also Marcia for presenting uh, explorative findings. So a lot of questions you already presented. I'm not going that way. And also I'm not talking about the development part of the actions that farmer will choose to implement. But I'm actually going in the beginning of the methodological part, just is for my understanding to clarify a few things. So I want to be uh, actually on for my PhD, I worked on forest and agrarian change, basically in Bangladesh, but also in some cross country setting in Asia. Africa and Latin America. So, uh, so, uh, so one um, actually from the uh, presentation of uh, NGO, uh, I got is uh, defining poverty. Probably, probably NGO can uh, just clarify me that the way community define poverty or wealth conditions, which actually varies from one hamlet to other hamlet. So I just want to see if NGO has observed this sort of differences because you have got three different livelihood zones and because of the upland or irrigated systems. So probably uh, did you get any differences or any you or the team, uh, yeah, try to understand how they define poverty or how, yeah, is there any differences? This is one question, probably I can, uh, one more question, can I ask also for Marcia, maybe just then you can. So it's about labor productivity, even though it seems common findings all across three zones. But my understanding is that because I worked on landscape gradient, which is kind of similar, but we have really a very selective criteria um, we adopted. And interestingly, that there is no difference um, for a lever intensity or lever distribution within these three zones, because there are also some substance agriculture systems, probably in one livelihood zone. And we know that, you know, that in subsistence agriculture system, there are a lot of levers available and you can easily engage. But when you go on to more intensified agriculture systems, probably you don't need it just because you can easily provide a lot of chemical fertilizer or other inputs. So actually reduces and also enhances yield. So it's, it's, it's interesting findings that there is no difference. It's probably it 
because of the countries, um, but it seems like no difference in terms of the level productivity, but usually subsistence agriculture have more labor available people, are, they don't have enough jobs so they can easily engage their time, they can offer compared to other area where a lot of opportunities available or, yeah. So yeah, these are the two, do you get, can, does it make sense? the question you're, you're giving to Marcia, what, what was the question in the end? As, I mean, it's, it, it seems like there is no differences in terms of labor productivity or labor distribution within these three like blue zones, but, but it seems like my experience tells that within subsistence system, because there are also one live blue zone, which is dominated by live subsistence agriculture. In subsistence system, probably more labor available, but within East Timor, probably that's a different case. So it seems really interesting to see that um, there is no difference. Uh, is there any other reason that uh, uh, labor is common issue all across live blue zone? Um, well, I might help Marcia a little bit. And so we, we, we didn't measure labor productivity per se in this process, but we did certainly identify that, that labor supply yeah, yeah, this was, was a, a common issue. And I might let Marcia speak to that in a moment. But Andrew, would you like to make some comment on different definitions of poverty in the different locations we did the stages of progress? Yes, okay, thanks for the question. Um, I'd have to say that looking across the different case studies, there is a, there's a kind of shared uh, understanding of what uh, relatively extreme poverty looks like. Uh, and it usually revolves around the kind of priorities of food, food and shelter. You know, if you can't provide those two um, needs, then that's the, really the poorest you can be. Um, as you go, there's gonna be variation as you go up the ladder as it were, or down the ladder. Um, so people will have, depending on the kind of livelihoods that they pursue, they will have different priorities in terms of uh, what sorts of things they, they desire to achieve, right? Um, so, for instance, if you were looking at fishing communities, there would be different, different uh, kind of uh, characteristics that they would agree on as defining features. But in this case, because all of these uh, communities we looked at were basically farming communities, there's, there's a certain commonality in, uh, about what they see as these key characteristics, what it looks like when you're under the poverty line and what it looks like when you're over it. I would say that's, that's more of a feature than differences, but it does depend a lot on the, the nature of the livelihood you're looking at, I think. So I'd say that as a general comment. Sure. Marcia, would you like to, to respond to the question? Uh, yes, sure, Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you for the question. Apologies, I couldn't catch your name. But yeah, I agree with you. It's it's. I could understand uh, from your question. It seems like there is no difference. But then, if there is no job really in, in up in the municipalities, then there should be people around to do the work. But then, what's what's the difference? The the level of productivity. That's a good question because. Um, with, with the manual work or manual labor that people is doing in the farm. So people are turning away from agriculture. They think like farmers feel like they cannot make money from that because of the high labor uh, input that they need to put into the farming system, but then with the low yield that they get. So uh, not, not much people doing farming. So for example, a farmer, he would have uh, children, youth growing up, but then they don't want to, uh, be working in the farm, so they prefer to go to the city, work, or 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 studying. So what's left is that only the elder uh, in the municip municipalities and they do the work. So not even though we feel like it's uh, a lot of people can come and then help doing the work in the farm, but it, but it's not actually people are turning away from agriculture, uh, especially from the municipalities. Yes, yeah, so. That's just I want. That's just what I want to add uh, to this one, and I think I want to just add a little bit to your question on the on for Dr. Andrew. Uh, you said uh, if my understanding, you were asking about the different definition of the poverty in each uh, study location. Uh, I had the joy of joining these stages of progress process uh, for all of the municipalities and joining the focus group discussion with the community it's really interesting because in in betano 
uh, that's the southern part, the community defined people who are poor is far away different from those that are in Ainaro. For example, in Betano, they don't want to consider some, they said maybe we give, they, they describe the poor people with house that's only made up of uh, palm trees or uh, or palm leaves or just uh, wood, but then they said it's not their case. For them, they housing is not uh, a factor or category to describe poor, uh, someone is poor because they, they, they said they prefer to have this type of house because it's very hot in Betano. So they'd rather uh, live in this area, uh, in this house condition rather than use a, 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 a zinc because it will, it will be very hard to live in that. So I just want to share my experience during the stages of progress on the discussion with the community. I hope I answer your question. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, how, any more questions? Well, I'm interested in that, that mechanisation thing. Um, um, both Graham and I worked at, uh, down to Natabora quite a lot. And there was a mechanic from the area that we came from that went there and and uh, fixed up engines. And the engines started pouring in. People came from all over the place with engines and wheelbarrows. And a lot of it was just a matter of putting oil in it. And that's really, so I, I was wondering whether when tractors are supplied, there's a mechanical um, education program at the same time. And, and a little extra question, when um, the organisation I was with bought a tractor, um, and I unfortunately had to specify what we wanted, but somebody else bought it and it was came back huge compared to what we needed. And of course, people used it as a, as a transport vehicle. They go through rivers because, you know, they could. And, and mm -hmm. it was no good getting a big tractor. It wore it out, you know, and... and uh, so I fully agree that, you know, small tractors are the way to go. Yeah. I, I don't know that we will, we will get into the business of providing tractors, but it will be, we will hopefully be in the business of understanding what labour productivity improvements can be made by which form of mechanisation. But I, I wholeheartedly agree with you that the two things go together, the, the, the type of mechanisation, but then also the support services to keep keep the system running. My early years in international agricultural research were in Laos and there the two-wheel tractors are, are ubiquitous but also all around the landscape are small shops where you can get most um, maintenance spare parts done and you, you look in Timor-Leste today and that's not there yet. It, it'll be a very important process. Now how you get to that point is an interesting question, but one that we probably do need to grapple with yet. Can I add to that just quickly? Go for um, it. One thing I'd just add is that uh, in Timor-Leste, there's been a, a real surge in people uh, buying motor cars and motorbikes uh, all over the country uh, because of increased incomes. And that's really fostered, I think, a, a sort of distribution of people with technical and motor skills. Uh, one of the best little businesses in anywhere you could, uh, you know, you want to develop would be in engine repair, you know, motor car maintenance. And that I think that is spreading uh, in a lot of places in Timor Leste. So that's one of the kind of, it's not directly related to farm machinery, but that is a, the skills of maintaining is much more widespread than they used to be. That would be my theory. Andrew and um, Wes, that sounds like a, a project for CDU TAFE is to, uh, you know, perhaps support that process. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Any other comments or questions? Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it's I, I just wondered whether the question of um, receptivity or the, the uh, uh, interest in people to get advice and new technology is, is, is something that you should investigate. Um, I personally feel a bit frustrated that um, a lot of good stuff that's been done doesn't get accepted, uh, maybe not for 20 years or something, and I don't think Timor's got that sort of generations of time left. No, no, you're quite right. 
probably been lots of thing, good ideas that have been a bit ahead of their time, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in? Andrew, here? go for it. Sorry. That's, no, I think it's, sorry. Great, it's a great <laughs> question. Uh, one thing, there's another great example, I think, in Timor Leste, that the, the need for a change is what is driving people to choose herbicide. So, in particularly in the western part of East Timor, the use of Roundup is becoming very widespread for the for the simple fact that they don't have the labour to do the clearing and weeding, and so people make the choice themselves and they buy it over the board over the border from mm. Atambu and so on from Indonesia, and it's I was really struck by how how much that's taking off, and that's the choice they make out of necessity I think because they haven't got the labour to weed the weed the fields. So there's an example, I think, of how technology in the end is persuasive because of it meets a need. You might argue that that's not the need that they should, it shouldn't be the one they choose, but to date, it's proving to be a winner for a lot of uh, households. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. So, shall, um... Any, if there's no other comments, you, those in the room, welcome to stay and chat. Those in building yellow too, welcome to pop over and chat. And maybe um, online speakers, uh, and Andrew and Marcia, we may let you off the hook. <laughs> what do you think? Okay. That's fine. Great, we might give you a round of applause. Thanks very much. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm very grateful connectivity has persisted to Dilly. So yes, indeed. It was super yes. clear, Marcia. So thanks a million. Thank you. No, thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye, Mama. Bye bye. Thank you.